1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before you in these moments of teaching, we ask, Lord, that you open our hearts. And even though a hard teaching, Lord Jesus, let us see your light and the love of Jesus Christ throughout it. In the name of the Christ, the King. Amen. And so the title of my sermon is, How Big Is Our Tent? Have you ever struggled with something, not something tried, but something really, really important? In grade school, I struggled with reading. Actually, grade school was difficult for me. What do you expect at four years old in kindergarten and holding down a part-time job? <laughs> All right, maybe the job part's a little stretch. But school was hard. In fact, school always seemed to end for the summer on my dad's birthday, May 26. And every year from kindergarten through sixth grade, I lived in perpetual fear that I might need to confess to dad on his birthday that I failed a grade. And what I learned back then was that I just had to work a whole lot harder than anyone else to understand what the teacher was teaching. Praise God, I may have struggled, but I never failed. Now today as a man, I am still struggling to understand. Oh, I understand perfectly well what the Lord has told me in the Bible and shown to me. But I struggle now to understand why people today live in habitual sin and our culture says it's okay. It's acceptable. Not only that, society is no longer asking me, asking you as Christians to tolerate such in sinful behavior, but to actually endorse and condone it. Culture demands that Christians see not a behavior as sin, when clearly the Bible teaches otherwise. People, we are indeed living in the days of Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Not too long ago, a pastor acquaintance of mine asked me if I preached on hot button topics of today. And my reply was something like this. I preached on those divisive cultural issues out of love. People need to know the truth of what the Bible says. And to that, my pastor friend replied, You're a brave man. I could never preach that way. What a shame to be afraid to preach the gospel truth. Maybe I'm the one that's not so wise today in preaching on sin. But I am not one of those teachers about whom 2 Timothy 4 teaches and foretells. Timothy tells us, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. 
Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. I'm not one of those to tell you what you want to hear. I will tell you what you need to hear. I'm more of a 2 Timothy 4 verses 1 and 2 kind of preacher. In the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing at His kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. That's me, preaching from the Word of God, the Holy Bible. That's us as a church, and maybe today is meant to remind us not only who we are, but whose we are. One of the two questions asked when anyone joins this church is this. Do you accept the Holy Scripture, the Old and New Testaments, as the Word of God and the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct? No written discipline, no written doctrine, only the Holy Bible does this church, upon it do we stand. Would we all agree? Amen. Yeah. So if we all agree that the Holy Bible is the Word of God and the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct, let me lay another foundation stone before we proceed. One of the building blocks upon which we stand is written, in 2 Timothy 3.16, hear the word of the Lord. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in, in righteousness. Let's look at these first two words of this verse. All Scripture. All means all. It doesn't mean you can be selective. Pick the verses you like and discard the verses you don't like. It doesn't mean you can change God's Word to fit your lifestyle or your predisposed inclinations and attitudes. It doesn't mean you can intellectually change what the Bible calls sin to not sin. I told you early on that I was struggling, and so it is even now, this very moment. For seemingly centuries, the world view on habitual sin was basically this, shame. Preachers preached against it, politicians lobbied against it. Today many preachers endorse and politicians vote in favor of behaviors that once were a social aberration. Because too many preachers are silent, or worse, subscribe to false teaching, remember those itching ears, America has lost its moral compass. The Lord God has given to mankind the Ten Commandments. And so that we're all together in the same place, the first commandment says, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There is no other God with higher authority, more wisdom, more power, and greater glory. Moving on to the second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or the likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them, nor serve them, for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God. I think it's good to go back to basics and review just who we are as Christians. We follow God, and in spite of the fact that He has given us a free will, there are guardrails that guard our behaviors. Like the white line painted along the side of the road to caution us from going into the ditch, God has set parameters for our living as a people of God. In today's anything goes culture, those who routinely participate in habitual sin do so under the false teaching 
that God loves me. So my behavior is okay and is acceptable. In their minds. Though they may have a golden calf, not have a golden calf to worship, they bow down to their own intellect, which does not condemn, and with no condemnation, there is no repentance, and with no repentance, there is no salvation. They see then not their behaviors, their habitual sin as sin. They say they love God, but their behavior does not honor the Lord. They completely ignore what we just read in 1 John 1, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, that is, walk in sin, we lie and do not the truth. The New International Version says it this way. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. This verse is the guardrail I keep ramming into when someone lives an ungodly life and truly believes that God will not hold them accountable for their sin. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 should scare any one of us into righteous living. Hear and know what the Lord says. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor feminine, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetors, not drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Paul even expands this list of unrighteous lifestyles in Galatians 5.19. Now Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, But small is the gate to narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Just because... Just because politicians change man's law and condone homosexual marriage and behaviors doesn't mean that it's okay. Just because politicians say that sin and transgenderism is okay doesn't mean that God's law has changed. Hebrews 13.8 describes Jesus for us. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Righteous living doesn't change with the times. God's law doesn't change with man's law. So while we're here, we all know what the Bible says about homosexuality, but what about this new thing that has come upon us like a storm in the last 10 years or less called transgenderism? Now you might think that the Bible is silent on this subject, but it is not. We just read it in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Among the list of habitual sins in the Word of God is the word effeminate. And here's the definition of that word. With reference to a man having characteristics and ways of behaving traditionally associated with women. Now you know transgenderism is a sin. And before one, any one of us became a Christian, we lived in unrighteousness too. But when we said yes to Jesus, we came to faith. And that faith produces a change of heart that results in repentance. And repentance was and is the catalyst to change in our lifestyles to that of godly righteous living. And that same invitation we heard and accepted from Jesus, come follow me, the Lord extends to those living in habitual sin, no matter what the sin might be. If that's where you're at, open the door of your heart to the Lord. Come now and let us reason together, 
saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. Yes, there is room in our Father's house. Jesus died for not just some sins. He died for all sins. In our reading today, in 1 John 1, 9, we hear, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, after hearing all of that teaching about the sin nature of sinful living, what are we to do who know biblical truth? How are we as Christians to respond to the moral decline, the decadence in which we live today? As far as the worldview is concerned, unless God sends a tidal wave of revival, it would seem that we as Christians are losing the battle for the moral high ground. And so how do we live with all that sin that surrounds us each and every day? First of all, know that Jesus died for whosoever believeth in Him. He said that in John 3.16. God gave His only begotten Son, and that's what Jesus did. He died for our sins. All sins. So we ask ourselves, what did Jesus not do? For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Jesus didn't come to point a finger and condemn anyone, although He always did point out the sin. He came to love all, even those living in habitual sin and denying what He teaches in the Bible. Even so, the love of Jesus is just beyond comprehension. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You know, on the cross, it wasn't the nails that held our Lord there. It was His boundless love for all mankind. And though we as Christians may seemingly have lost the cultural battle, we need to be ever mindful of what Jesus said in John 13. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. You ask, who are we to love? Jesus gives us an all-inclusive answer when he said, You have heard it said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How are we to react to people living in habitual sin? As a Christian, we love them as Jesus loved them. They will know we are Christians by our love. Not always telling them the truth about the Bible right up front because long before truth has a chance, love has a hearing. You will never win your wayward child back if you always drive home the truth. But you might win them back by loving them, loving them to Jesus and praying earnestly for them that the Lord might change their lives. So I need to tell you that many churches today in America are exhibiting love, or so they think, by making their tent a whole lot bigger, meaning they're engaging in false teaching to accommodate sinful behaviors in our culture. So you're wondering, where does this church stand? When any one of us came into this fellowship of believers, into this tent, did we not all enter in carrying our own arm load of sins? Yet were we not accepted? Were we not loved by this family of believers? 
And so here's the answer to your question. At this church, everyone, everybody, no matter the sin, is welcome here with this caveat. You are welcome unless you pose a harm to someone else. All the sins of the Lord that He enumerates in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and Galatians 5, 19, and in Romans 1, are welcome here at this table of the Lord. It is here that they all will find love. It is in this place that you will be taught, that they will be taught, the love of Jesus can deliver you from your sins and save you to heaven. Yes, it's a struggle to tell people the error of their ways. It's hard, but at the same time, we don't want to love them to hell by ignoring biblical truth. We want to love them to heaven by sharing biblical truth. Amen. With the love of Jesus and by the grace of the Holy Spirit and that which He imparts to us. First Covenant Church is an open, not affirming the sinful acts, but an open church to all. All are welcome to this tent. Tell that to your friends. Tell that to your family who need to at least have a chance to experience the love of Jesus through His people. Your invitation just might be the difference in where they spend eternity. As I close, remember this. God has not abandoned and He's not forsaken us. Could it be that revival starts right here. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the truth that the Bible teaches each and every one of us. Blessed be Christ the King. Amen. Amen. Let us pray.